All right, let's go ahead and get started uh, here. I certainly want to thank everybody for coming. Um, we are very fortunate to have Mark Anzi, uh, who's with us. And, and, and in fact, I wish he would have a little P22 next to his name, because I want to make sure everybody knows that uh, he's a proud parent of Ahoya here at Georgetown, obviously. Um, President and CEO of Colony Capital. Um, and we're, we're very fortunate um, to have uh, Stuart Lerner, uh, class of 2022, uh, thank goodness, uh, here to introduce both of us. Um, Stuart, uh, as I tell him, you got to take all the credit you can get in this world. And, and he's responsible for us being here right now, having a relationship uh, and a friendship with Mark Stoddard to help to put this together. So I'll go ahead and turn it over to you, Stuart, but thank you for what you did, my friend. Yeah, and thank you, Professor Seifer. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Digital Infrastructure and the Rotation to Real Assets event hosted by the Georgetown University Steer Center for Global Real Estate. My name is Stuart Lerner and I'm a junior at Georgetown studying Mandarin and business. I've developed a passion for real estate at Georgetown thanks to the Steer Center, its leader, Dr. Matt Seifer, who will be our moderator this afternoon, and the many opportunities he has created for students to get hands-on experience with real estate, such as GUPREV, the Georgetown University Public Real Estate Fund, and the new Steer Center Private Equity Fund which will be one of three student-run real estate private equity funds in the country. Dr. Seifer previously held leadership positions at Invesco Real Estate, and he currently serves on the board of Global Medical Re. <clears throat> Thankfully for us students, he has answered a higher calling and has devoted his energy to all things real estate at Georgetown, where he is the Atara Kaufman Professor of Real Estate. I wanna thank Professor Seifer, not only for his dedication in the classroom, but more importantly for being a great mentor and cheerleader to many of us as we begin our careers. Today, we are very fortunate to welcome one of the top industry leaders, Mr. Mark Ganzi, who has been a pioneer and highly successful entrepreneur in digital real estate for over 25 years. He founded Global Tower Partners, which became one of the largest privately owned cell tower companies in the US before being acquired for $4.8 billion in 2013. He also founded Digital Bridge Holdings, a leading global investor in mobile and internet infrastructure, which was acquired by Colony Capital last year. Mr. Ganzi now serves as president and CEO of Colony Capital, where he is driving Colony's transformation from a traditional real estate private equity investor to the premier platform for digital infrastructure and real estate investment, with approximately $50 billion of assets under management. With the recent impacts of COVID-19 on traditional real estate, Colony timing couldn't be better. If you invested in Colony common stock when Mr. Gansey took over in July, you would be enjoying a 90% return already. Amazingly, he has accomplished so much without the benefit of a Georgetown education, <laughs> but we are lucky to have his daughter, Riley, who is also a junior in our Hoya community. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Mark Gansey. Well done, Stuart. I'm, I'm, so I'm not sure if we have any... Uh... Harrison Street folks on the line, but uh, you, you were smart enough to, uh, to hire young Stuart here as your intern. And uh, you also have engaged a gentleman by the name of uh, Baraj Sundaram that's also gonna be coming full time. So we appreciate what you're doing here at Georgetown on the employment front. So you know, Mark, thanks so much for being here, man. We, we, we appreciate it. I know you're, uh, you're a busy guy. I, I have to say, every time I send you an email, I think you kick something back to me within, within about five minutes. So I certainly appreciate that. So you're on the phone a lot, but um, you know, I thought we could get started as, uh, and maybe I'm admitting something I shouldn't admit, but it doesn't take much to figure out that I'm a very traditional real estate guy. Um, and so I'm very interested in what's going on at Colony Capital, which frankly, I think of as, as a historically anyway, a pretty traditional, you know, real estate company. And so um, could you level set us a little bit just with defining what Colony means by digital infrastructure? Yeah, and first of all, thank you. Uh, really appreciate the opportunity to speak to uh, the Georgetown community. It's a, such a great and special community um, and has great rich history in my family. My uncles went there, my daughter goes there. And uh, unfortunately, I didn't get into Georgetown. Uh, Stuart was correct. I didn't get a Georgetown. Oh my goodness, he didn't know that. Now he feels horrible the, about the comment. I had to go to this second rate <laughs> school called Wharton, but uh, <laughs> it's something that my daughter reminds me of every day. But um, Thankful for my daughter and Stuart and all of her friends. Uh, it's been fun to be a part of that community. But um, you know, digital real estate is um, is candidly, Matthew, one of the more interesting asset classes today. 
And, and it's never been more relevant or important as we've just undergone you know, significant transformation in COVID. And so as we think about how we now have been able to maintain our lives and do all of the things that we were able to do in COVID, you couldn't do it without digital infrastructure. And so as an asset class, just like commercial real estate has many different verticals, digital real estate and digital infrastructure has a couple of sub verticals. And as I go through them to, to all of you, it'll be apparent when I, when I describe them, you're like, oh yes, I, I, I know what that is, but it's not, digital infrastructure is not something that's visibly apparent uh, to the average eye. It's something that works in the background. It's sort of the plumbing that helps keep the internet and keeps applications and mobile infrastructure running. So there's really four critical food groups in digital real estate today. One is the oldest one is mobile towers. So cell phone towers, you see them along the highways going out into Virginia and Maryland. That's probably the old, oldest vertical. That started in the early, uh, early 90s. And some of those companies became REITs in 2006 and 2007 and 2008. And so that's, you know, it wouldn't surprise you that the three top cell tower companies in the world are in the top 10 biggest REITs in the world now, which is interesting because if you go back 10 years ago, it was, what was it? It was Simon. Right. It was what? Boston Properties. It was Vornado. And now you've got American Tower and Crown Castle sitting at the top. So this rotation to digital real estate um, isn't just a new phenomenon. You know, American Tower and Crown Castle have been, you know, in the top 10 of the REIT index for a very, very long time. Um, the second vertical, which many of you might know, is um, data centers. And I know there's some alumni at Georgetown that have been actively involved in the data center space for a long time. So data centers actually take on now three different types of property varieties. The first is what we call hyperscale data centers. Those are these very, very large data centers that sit actually out in Virginia. Um, Ashburn, Virginia is one of the biggest hubs of data centers in the world. In fact, you know, almost 40% uh, of the cloud uh, originates out of Ashburn, Virginia. Small fact for, for Georgetown students as they drive out to Dulles and catch an airplane for the holidays, you'll go past 40% of the uh, global workload for cloud right now. Um, second is uh, what we call co-location uh, interconnection. So this is, these are data centers that house um, racks and servers for enterprises, for applications, and uh, has a lot of fiber that comes in and comes out, which is interconnection. And so we, we, we call that enterprise co-location. And then the last is what we call managed services. And so managed services is the third vertical in data centers, which is you, you, you have an outsourced solution where you manage IT stacks for corporations. And that's a, you know, a, a, a modestly lucrative business. Two more verticals, fiber, fiber optics, all of this requires cabling and it requires high-speed data transmission to make you know, the phones work, to make your computer work, to make everything work in your life. You need fiber. Most of us now have a fiber connection to our house. Certainly at Georgetown, you've got fiber connections into all of the student buildings now, finally. And uh, fiber is probably the most important vertical because if you can't have low latency, high speed connectivity, it's really hard to make all of this ecosystem work. And then the last thing, which is probably the most hidden of the asset classes is a small cell infrastructure. So these are small little antennas mounted uh, inside of um, you know, dormitories. It could be inside of an airport. Uh, sometimes these antennas are on street corners. We run fiber up the pole to the antenna and uh, it, it acts as a small tower. That's the smallest of the verticals, but small cell infrastructure is becoming incredibly important, particularly around uh, what's happening with artificial intelligence and IoT networks. A big trend that's gonna happen over the next 10 years, Matthew, is IoT. So today there's approximately about 5 billion sensors, IoT sensors, which are small cells. That's going to 50 billion in the next five years. And it's going to 500 billion over the next 10 years. It's crazy. And really the next iteration of this digital revolution is not so much consumer to consumer connections. It's really about device to device connections, which is AI, IoT, and some of these uh, big big data analytics. And some of the use cases are, are very interesting. But at the end of the day, it's towers, data centers, fiber, and small cells. Those are sort of the core four verticals of, of digital infrastructure. Well, I love that. Thank you. you. By the way, if you ever want to teach a digital infrastructure class at Georgetown, I think you'd be, you'd be well equipped. But you know, when we talk about fiber and, and small cell and low latency, I, I've sort of read a lot about that in connection with the autonomous movement and the need for the small cells and the fiber to ensure that the cars can operate properly without wrecks and things like that. Can, 
Can you talk a little bit about how that's factoring in on any of this stuff and knowing that there's a difference between being in a major market like DC and a, in a non-major market when it comes to that? I mean, what, what's the future for sort of maybe where this could go outside of major markets? Well, we have three case studies that, that we're involved with right now um, that uh, perhaps can shed some light on it. One of them is um, we're involved in a pretty exciting project with Carnegie Mellon, uh, Uber, and the city of Pittsburgh. So that famous uh, Uber car in Pittsburgh that had a wreck, that was actually, that ran on our network. Um, and the, you know, what, what the press ran with was autonomous vehicle, you know, hit, hits, a, hits another car and it was the autonomous vehicle's uh, fault. It actually wasn't. Uh, the, the final report was it was an elderly person driving a car who crashed into the autonomous vehicle. And so that project has been ongoing for about 18 months and it uses you know, two of our data centers, uses about 500 of our small cells. Um, and what I can say is the reliability of that Uber network in downtown Pittsburgh is about 99.999%. So it's almost perfect. But the problem is to go from almost perfect to perfect is a big jump there's a massive amount of incremental infrastructure that has to happen. So those trials are still ongoing pretty quietly, but it's, it's very interesting that, you know, what's ultimately going to hurt these autonomous vehicles isn't the actual autonomous vehicle. It's going to be the human error of another, of another vehicle, which ultimately is the cause of most accidents anyway. Another case study we've been working with is General Motors and um, the most recent Cadillac, uh, which is a, a small, I think it's called the STV or uh, it's, it's their small SUV. It operates when you put it on a major highway in the US now, it's about 90% autonomous. So you can actually take your hands off the wheel, you can take your hands off the pedals and the car will drive itself on pretty much most of the major US interstate system. Um, and that's operating off a platform called NVIDIA. I don't know if that's a name that most of you know, but NVIDIA is the largest artificial intelligence uh, company in the world supplying AI to automobile manufacturers. So Tesla runs on NVIDIA, Toyota runs on NVIDIA, General Motors runs on NVIDIA. And so all of NVIDIA's uh, AI uh, is, is um, stored and it's computed in Santa Clara. And it's in our third largest data center in Santa Clara. So we have a very strategic relationship with NVIDIA and they're a great tenant. And um, we're, we're proud to be a part of that General Motors project, which is going pretty well. And Tesla is not far behind either. If you put a Tesla on, on the new Tesla SUV that's coming out next year, it'll also be about 80 to 90% autonomous on, on major highways. And on these major highways, what's happening now is these cars are becoming data centers. You know, we're talking about a hundred terabytes of data per day going through a, a Cadillac SUV or a Tesla SUV. I mean, that's, that's like a small data center. It's really incredible. But to make that work, we need more towers. We need more fiber. We need more sensors. We need more edge data centers. So it's a, it's a big lift, but we're if we were playing sort of a nine inning baseball game, we're probably in the first or second inning of autonomous vehicles. It's very early and it'll probably take us, you know, Toyota estimates their first full autonomous vehicle will be in about five years. You know, Mark, I'm, I'm, I'm originally from Pittsburgh, so I know it well and I'm actively doing work up there. So I'm thrilled you're so involved in the city. And I'm going to go a little maybe off script. I hope I'm not going to put you in a tough spot, I be, but just based on what you're saying and, and the fact that you're at a colony, I'm just sort of curious, you know, this notion of the importance of location, right? You know, real estate is fundamentally based on quality of location. And you start to think about these things like autonomous vehicles and things that happen when you're not even awake. And, and, and you, could, you could get to a place where the, the importance of location sort of begins to ebb a little bit because frankly, it doesn't matter if it's out in Ashburn because the car is going to get your dry cleaning in the middle of the night and it's going to come back. So are, are, are you in colony with sort of the traditional real estate that you still have thinking at all about how location would be impacted or maybe even to broaden it out and maybe help you a little bit too is how much is the digital conversation that you're involved with impacting how you, you all think about the real estate side from a traditional sense? Well, er everything we do on the digital side is rooted in hardcore real estate principles. My, my background is, is real estate. Um, when I went to Wharton, I was involved in the, in the Zell Lurie Real Estate Center actively, and uh, Peter Lineman was one of my great uh, mentors. And the reason I got into the digital infrastructure business is because I understood title. I understood a lease. I understood how to get a permit. Uh, I understood how to, how to transact in real estate. And the basic fundamentals of what you learn in, in fundamental real estate 
is resident in everything we do in digital real estate. Every one of our customers enters into a lease with us. So the reason why we're a REIT and why we're going to you know, probably maintain our REIT status is because all of our income is good income, good rental income. And the only difference is it's just the quality of the cash flows and the tenor and the duration of those cash flows from a credit stratification perspective. So most of our customers are entering into 10, 15, 20 year leases. Most of our customers are Amazon, Microsoft, Verizon, AT&T. And so, you know, we have an incredibly strong credit profile and greater than 65% of our cash flows at Colony today come from investment grade counterparty risk. And our weighted average duration of our contracts are about 6.8 years in duration. So what's making investors have a lot of comfort and confidence is rooted in the most simple real estate principle of all, credit stratification, right? And at the end of the day, most good real estate guys are credit guys. Like you understand how to ultimately package these leases up. How do you ultimately securitize them? How do you get to the rating agencies and get the best rating? And then ultimately when you go and price that real estate debt, most of our debt is, is mortgage-backed securities, by the way which is just a page I ripped out of the traditional you know, real estate playbook. So I was the first one to do a CMBS in cell towers hmm. in 2005. And everyone said, well, why are you doing that? I said, because it's 30 year paper. It's got no covenants. It's got no cash traps. And it's about the cheapest money you can find. Why wouldn't we put that paper? And I've got a better credit story than Mace Rich, And I've got a better credit story than Boston Properties. Yep. And so we started securitizing small cells, data centers, fiber routes, cell towers, and the last securitization we did, Matthew, was at 1.78% for 30 years. It's like free money. Right. So that's a big part of what we do. And, and I also think, you know, what's what, what a lot of people don't see is how hard it is to do the permitting on this stuff. The permitting on this stuff is just as hard as commercial real estate, if not harder. People don't want to see towers. You know, people don't want to see a big data center. People don't want their street ripped up with fiber going through it. So we face a lot of public resistance, similar to how a real estate developer would face uh, a lot of resistance. And so we've got local teams all around the world in Asia, in Europe, in Latin America, in the US uh, that help us get our entitlements where we act locally. You know, we perform globally, but we act locally. And that's those principles are resident, whether, you know, we're in the medical office property space or whether we're in the data center space, it's the same. It's really the same techniques that you're using at the end of the day. So when, when our students are, are learning about these things and they're learning about fee, and they're learning about collateral. These are things that you can take with you all the way through your career. And if you weaponize them correctly and intelligently, you're going to you're going to do well in real estate, whether you're in traditional real estate or whether you're in digital real estate. I love it, man. I love it. Thank you for that. Well, you know, uh, when I looked at, at at Colony a bit, it, it seems like you're involved in in sort of company acquisition as opposed to sort of maybe doing you know direct investment. And you you talk about the locality, and so much of this is just having the local market knowledge. So, can you talk a little bit about Colony's business plan here um, at a high level, and and maybe even the preface to that just the rotation out of, and, and maybe not exclusively, but the rotation out of traditional real estate into digital, what, 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 what drove that? Well, I think I have to give credit to our founder and chairman, Tom Barrick. Um, I've been friends with Tom for 31 years. He was uh, my mentor uh, when I went to Thatcher uh, prior to going to college. And um, he just kept a good watch on my career and was always a big supporter of mine. We, uh, we reconnected about seven years ago when I started Digital Bridge, and uh, we made our two investments in, in two different cell tower companies. He, he always was very gracious in, in, uh, in offering his support and, and certainly investing with us where he's done quite well. And um, as, as he made these two investments with us back in 2013 and 14, he, he, he came to me about four years ago and uh, invited me out to LA and said, explain to me a little bit more about this digital real estate stuff. I keep I keep getting your quarterly updates and all I see is returns going up, growth going up. And, you know, is there, is there something bigger we can be doing here? And so we spent about a year talking about it. We ultimately formed a joint venture together uh, to go raise our first fund, Digital Colony Partners One. And um, what we learned along that road is, is the partnership worked. There was a great cultural fit between the Colony people and the DigiBridge people. And um, the fund was oversubscribed in, in six months. Uh, we deployed the fund in about 18 months, uh, and the returns in fund one have been, you know, the marks are up about 1.25 after 18 months. So it's a it's an incredible start. And along that road, he said, well, why don't we just merge? And why don't you help me take Colony 
out of the old real estate and push us into the new frontier. Um, I've been looking for someone to uh, be my partner and I've been looking for someone that has the energy and the, uh, and the tenacity to take Colony into the future. So I, you know, I, I blindly just said yes, because Tom's a very charming guy. Right. Um, should have probably done a little more homework, but uh, it was a heavy lift. And so we, we ended up merging our companies together last July. Uh, the board made the mandate that within 18 months, I would replace Tom as CEO. And ultimately the board pushed that up to uh, July of this year. So July one, I stepped into the CEO chair. You know, since I've been here for 18 months, um, what I've tried to do is, is, is really stick to four core principles that have worked for me in any business that I've ever run. And I've run six different companies in my career and I've had some simple rules to live by. And, and, and that's what we've done with our public shareholders is we've been very clear with them. We've been very transparent with them. And we've said, we're only gonna do these four things over the next 24 months. And along that road, we're gonna show you measured progress and we're gonna be very communicative with you so you know exactly what we're doing. And we said, here's what we're gonna do. We're A, we're gonna delever the company. We took leverage from 12 times down to about seven and a half times in a year. Um, told them we're gonna cut the cost structure. I've delivered about hundred million in GNA cuts. Went from 27 offices down to 11, 498 employees, now down to 283 employees. And um, just trying to instill a new sense of uh, discipline throughout the entire organization around how we spend other people's money. And uh, the other thing that we said we'd do is we'd sell traditional real estate. We've, we've laid out a very clear schedule over the next two years and uh, it's worked out incredibly well. We've sold $22 billion of real estate in the last 18 months. We have another circa about 23 billion left to sell, which we have a clear glide path. We sold another 500 million of assets this week, selling off our bulk industrial portfolio. And, um, and then we said we would grow. We would return for the first time uh, colony capital would be an organic growth story again. So, you know, we put strong digital assets on our balance sheet to keep recompliance. And then we'd continue to raise capital at a, just an absolutely stunning pace. So we make money two ways at Colony now. We have real estate assets on the balance sheet that are REIT eligible, which is Vantage and Data Bank and some of the other things that we own on the balance sheet that create what we call digital operating earnings. And then on the other side of the ledger, we have our investment management business where we have the Digital Bridge Legacy Companies, we have Digital Colony One and all of our future funds. And we generate you know, approximately about $120 million a year in fees. And that's growing really fast. We're raising a lot of third-party capital. And that's where we look, we look a little bit like a, a Blackstone or a KKR or a Carlisle. So we have this interesting mix where we have the investment management business. And then we have the balance sheet, which is really the, the hardcore REIT. And, um, you know, the rotation's going well. We're at about 58% rotation. Uh, when I got here, it was 80-20 traditional real estate. Um, we should end the year at about 60-40. And then next year, we'll be at about 90-10. So uh, very clear guardrails. And, um, and then we, we, we changed out the leadership team. Sorry, there's a fifth thing. Leadership is really important. And I've had a great group of leaders that have worked with me for the last two decades. Um, people that know what they're doing, that are very competent, very qualified. And um, the, the street is really like the story. As Stuart said, if you invested in Colony in the last uh, two quarters, you've done reasonably well because we've, we've generally just put out a, a set of guardrails that people can understand. And uh, most importantly, we're delivering, we're exceeding expectations. And so are you, are you gonna rotate out of real estate entirely or what, you know, what you know, if, if any, will you retain sort of in-house and, and investing continually? I think the goal is we, we promised everyone 90% rotation and, um, you know, where, where we've guided the street to is uh, we have two, two, two chunky assets that are, that are in the process of being, you know, carefully, um, shall we say, uh, under strategic review. Uh, yeah. One is a business you know well, which is our wellness infrastructure business. So we have approximately about 400 medical properties, Matthew. Uh, we generate about 250 million of EBITDA. It's mostly MOBs, hospitals, skilled nursing, some senior living, um, and it's a clean business. It's a, it's a well-run business, and actually in COVID, it's done really well. It's been one of the surprises. Um, we'll actually hit 98 to 99% of our FFO in 2020 that we hit in 2019. Mm. So we really weren't that impacted in COVID in, uh, in, in our, our wellness infrastructure business. The, uh, the other business is, um, so that's about a $3.2 $3 billion business. We have a $3 billion mortgage REIT called CLNC. It trades publicly. I put new leadership in place there. 
Um, it now operates independently, it trades independently. So we're giving that, we've given it its separation, it's moving out. So we, we, should be, we should be out of the mortgage REIT business and we should be out of the, you know, the medical um, infrastructure space uh, pretty soon. And what we'll be left with is our legacy colony, private equity and private debt funds, where we still have three funds that are winding down. And every quarter we sell, you know, two to three assets. We'll announce, you know, we, 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 we committed to the street. We'd sell three assets this quarter. Um, we'll make an announcement in the next couple of weeks of a couple more assets we've sold. And so we're in the midst of an orderly wind down of our traditional uh, real estate funds. Well, I, I can say if you're ever interested in a family discount on any of that MOB stuff, we'd love to take a peek at it before you take it out. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you. Can you talk about uh, just, I mean, you've been very acquisitive, even in the, even in November. I, I By my count, it was just a very simple Google search. You did something in Denver. You did something in Brazil. I think you did something in Mexico. Can you can you talk about just your acquisition agenda and, and sort of how your uh, your, your kind of next, you know, 12 months looks and, and especially on a, on a global level. Yeah. So we we operate out of four, uh, four, four, four hemispheres. We're, we're in Asia where we're based in Singapore, London for Europe. Um, we manage Latin America out of Boca and then uh, North America is out of New York and, and, and Boca Raton as well. And so it's been a good year for us. Um, we've gotten nine deals done. We've deployed about 20, Call it circa 23, 23 and a half billion of capital has been put out this year. Um, we'll probably announce one more deal between now and the end of the year, but we've got a Ford pipeline of about 37, 38 deals, uh, which is another 20 billion in enterprise value. So we anticipate, you know, probably hitting on, I would say, of those of that opportunity set, probably 20% of those opportunities will hit on next year. So we're on a cadence to do five to six new deals next year. Um, we've announced, you know, two new deals in Asia recently. Uh, we formed a hyperscale data center platform called Agile, which is building in Osaka and building in Seoul and, and in Melbourne. And then uh, we backed a, a proven management team in Towers out of Malaysia, uh, where we've done two acquisitions. And so we're, we're looking to roll up the Asian, Southeast Asian cell tower space, which nobody's done yet. So those are two, two, two sectors we've done historically really well in but a new geography uh, for us in Asia. And then in terms of other deals, I mean, we're, we're very active in Latin America. As you said, we've done a bunch of stuff in Brazil. You know, in the last 24 months, a lot of people have run away from Brazil. We actually, you know, I've been investing in, in, in Latin America for 20 years. It's when the, the regular investors run away from places like Brazil is when you want to run to it. And so we see a ton of value in Brazil. Um, it's, it's, it's the uh, fastest social media market in the world. Hmm. Uh, it's the fastest Kager growth uh, online gaming market in the world. Brazilians love their gaming. And so between their, their, their just gregarious social mentality and, and, and wanting to game and, and you know, it's, it's, it's one of the more interesting markets in the world. And so the infrastructure is just way behind. They're probably a decade behind the U.S. So we're seeing huge opportunities in, in Brazil right now. And the currency kind of gapped out at almost six dollars. So I've never seen the REI get close to six. So we just leaned in. We just think it's a once in a decade opportunity. So we're investing in data centers. We're investing in towers. We're investing in fiber. We think Brazil is one of the most exciting places to be. And we're a bit of a contrarian there. Not a lot of people are running to Brazil right now. Um, we like Europe. We've been very active in Europe. We did two new deals in Europe last year. Uh, we'll announce a new deal in Europe uh, probably first quarter is when it'll be public. But it, it's it's been very active. Europe is a is a really interesting theater and it's it's a couple of years behind the US in cloud computing. So a lot of what we're doing is, is helping our, our domestic US cloud customers expand their footprint in Europe because of the data sovereignty laws. So that's creating a really unique opportunity for us to you know, take our master lease agreements, take our design specs and take our customers and run to Europe. And um, we've done really well there. It's, uh, it's, a hard, it's a hard theater to perform in Europe as you know, from your traditional real estate days, but Permitting is a little harder, getting power is a little harder. Uh, everything's a little bit harder in Europe, but we're, we're seeing higher returns in data centers right now in Europe. So, so I'm listening as, as you're talking and I'm sort of drawing corollaries to like um, sort of the manufactured housing business that was a lot of like individual small operators that institutions got in and sort of professionalized and bought up. And, you know, clearly data centers is a very sophisticated business, but some of this fiber 
and some of the small cell. Can you talk a little bit about the, the just the, the the you know the institutional involvement in that space, and, and and is that really the opportunity to come in and in, in scale? Well, there there is an opportunity. I think we've we've had a lot of success rolling up the mom and pop small fiber players. Um, and, and that's worked out pretty well for us. We did that in Canada. We've done a roll up in Canada of five different fiber companies in Montreal and Toronto to build a challenger brand of Rogers and Bell. And then we've also played, you know, we've also gone elephant hunting where we bought Zayo for 14 billion. Um, where at one shot, we got 135,000, you know, route miles of fiber, which is the largest, you know, one largest domestic US fiber uh, routes in the, uh, you know, in this hemisphere. So we can play small, we can play big. I think that's one of the great, things about our organization today is we don't let the check size define the opportunity. That's kind of one of our big mantras in investment committee. We never say, if somebody says, oh, this check is too small, uh, they usually get a wrath of, you know what, from the rest of the team, right. because we don't believe uh, check size defines the opportunity. The returns define the opportunity. And we're, we're laser focused on, on returns back to our LPs. That's, the, that's always the gating factor. And maybe talking about the LPs a little bit, I'm sort of curious. Out of that 22 billion you've you've uh, you've sold in 18 months, I'm, you know what what percentage is is actually recycled into this stuff, and you know what's what's the investor appetite? Obviously, it's significant, but maybe you could you could describe sort of the buckets of capital that's most interested in this, and maybe where they come from globally. Yeah, well, if it's a balance sheet investment, we've recycled the cash back to the balance sheet, and we're deploying that balance sheet right back into digital real estate. So that's been quite easy, and so. The benefactor of that are our public shareholders. So for every dollar of traditional real estate that comes back to the balance sheet, um, we can deploy it back into digital real estate where our expectation is we're going to deliver 2.2 to 2.5 MOIC in five to seven years. And that's a set of arithmetic that public investors get really fast. It's not hard for them to wrap their heads around that. I would say on the private investing front, um, we're, we're having a lot of success everywhere. And so I would say our biggest investors globally are pension funds. And sovereign wealth funds, those are probably the two biggest uh, private investors we have. Um, I'd also say insurance companies have been pretty good. And um, also we call fund to fund managers. So between, between those four, those are probably, you know, that's probably our four biggest uh, investor types in, in our private funds business. Got it. You know, I'm going to take a question here from, from, from the audience a bit. It says, you know, despite what we would consider record absorption. We've seen rents in Northern Virginia market continue to fall. This is a, you know, as it relates to data centers yeah. over the past decade. How do you weigh or rank the impacts of you know, new supply, you know, decreased construction costs and a lower acceptable development yields in terms of contribution to the rental rate collapse? And where do you think that the rental rates ultimately will settle for both typical co-location users as well as um, hyperscalers? Yeah, and Ashburn's one of those really unique markets. Um, there's just been a flood of inventory in Ashburn. So pricing has compressed in Ashburn a lot faster than other places in the world. And we've, we've got one campus in Ashburn and it's our worst performing campus globally, um, which is pretty interesting. But we made an intentional decision to really not go deep on Ashburn. So we're the largest landlord in Santa Clara. Um, you know, in Santa Clara, we're getting rates that are on the order of magnitude of 25% to 75% higher than Ashburn, but it's a unique market and there's not a lot of power in California. So the ability to get, you know, will serve letters and assemble really good real estate in Santa Clara is, uh, is, is, is a unique talent. And that's something that we've decided to do. And we tried to stay out of the food fight in Ashburn. We bought a big piece of, we bought a little under hundred acres about three and a half years ago. And we just turned on our first data hall this year, which was about 25 megawatts with two customers. And we lose, we lose most of the jump balls in Ashburn because the problem is the reason rental rates have fallen is because um, private capital has flooded into the data center space yeah. and it's infrastructure capital. And so infrastructure capital is not real estate capital and it's willing to accept a lower return than traditional real estate. So you've seen this rotation of the equity base in data centers move from, you know, sort of private equity, real estate, and now infrastructure capital and infrastructure capital is prepared to write to a single digit IRR, which is from a traditional real estate perspective is not acceptable. Yeah. So I think in Ashburn, that's, that's the big you know, challenge right now is you've got you know, six or seven private operators that have flooded the market with inventory. Now, what I'd say is you know, we're, we're operating very efficiently in places like Quincy, um, 
uh, Goodyear, Arizona, um, Quebec City, Montreal, Santa Clara. And, and in those markets, we're getting the rental rates we want to get. The only market that we've been disappointed with rental rates has been Ashburn. And then in Europe, we're in eight markets and we're seeing, you know, rental rates, you know, comparable to those Santa Clara rates, um, which is some of these markets are just really hard. Once again, the difficulty of getting a will serve letter from the power company largely dictates inventory and, and what you can charge a customer. You know, you've brought up power a couple of times and obviously that's critically important um, in the data center space and you, you're, you're active in Europe. And I'm just curious, what, what's your sort of environmental sort of rhetoric, if you will, in this space? Because it's particularly important over there and with the new administration, seemingly that's going to become even more important here. So just kind of curious as to your take. Yeah, well, our take is pretty aggressive. Um, we outlined our, our, our global ESG policy about six months ago in our Q1 call, uh, defining a set of core principles that all of our portfolio companies would, would undertake. And so we've committed to going completely carbon neutral by 2035, all of our portfolio companies. Um, one of them went carbon neutral this year. Um, our two big data center operators are operating at more than 60% green energy now. Uh, with a commitment to get to 100% over the next 18 months. So, you know, we're taking aggressive positions on this because we think it matters. Um, and also our investor base, you know, our pension systems, and they want to know that we're doing the right thing for the environment. And, you know, ESG is, a, is an important approach of our investment principles. And it's beyond just doing what's right for the environment and getting your companies to carbon neutral. It's also about, you know, putting in place a set of social standards that I can feel proud about. And it's also putting in place, you know, strong governance and creating a, a, a platform of equality across all of our portfolio companies and our boards. And so it's, it's something we leaned into hard at the beginning of last year. And um, we, we think our policies and, and our commitment is, is out, of, out in front of our peers. And so we have two more companies that'll go carbon neutral next year. And um, we're just going to keep moving in that direction. We might lose a little bit of returns. I think one of the things that we all have to measure is, you know, our social responsibility against our returns. What are we willing to sacrifice in returns to create a planet that ultimately our children and their children will survive and be able to use? That stuff actually matters. And so, you know, this, this social responsibility element of our investing policies is actually really important and has come in a very sharp focus. So. I bet. I mean, the steer center is very actively looking at that space and getting involved in that space as well. Cause frankly, in real estate, I think we're behind a lot of these other areas of, of business in, in, in generally from an ESG perspective, but um, you know, continuing with some, some uh, Q and a here, if you're a traditional investor in real estate and you're, you you do not have a digital infrastructure background and you're buyers of traditional commercial real estate, how would you be thinking and advising those investors to be viewing the future and from the standpoint of, look, you know, our client capital gives us money to buy real estate, but there's a digital infrastructure, digital future for all of us that's going to be significant. How, how should that be impacting the way we would look at traditional real estate? Well, I look at, I look at, you know, for example, I was, I was talking, you mentioned uh, Jonathan Gray, who's uh, somebody I, I went to school with, and he's, he's a very smart real estate mind. You know, what Blackstone has done is they've made the decision to go into logistics and focus on industrial that supports cloud. And so ultimately, as we think about fulfillment and ultimately uh, how goods and services get moved, uh, logistics becomes a, a very important part of the digital ecosystem. And so, you know, we, we've spent a lot of time around this, um, helping some of our, you know, industrial property owners, you know, put in, uh, you know, 5G enterprise networks, redesigning loading docks for autonomous trucks. Um, there's a lot of digital aspects in industrial real estate today. And so if you understand digital, you can understand logistics. And that's why logistics has done so well, because there's a voracious appetite for ultimately that last mile strategy. Whereas, you know, fulfillment, fulfillment to consumer. And so any business models that are, you know, adapted around cloud, you know, fulfillment, those are really good real estate business models yep. that require brick and mortar. Um, you know, I think life sciences is pretty interesting. Life sciences, real estate. I think that's something, Matthew, you know a little bit about as well. And I think, you know, as we think about, you know, coming out of COVID and we think about different types of, you know, commercial properties that support wellness infrastructure in general, I actually think that's a good place to be. I think taking care of 
of people and taking care of their health is something that's not going away anytime soon. I think the medical system in our country is broken a little bit. That's something we've got to fix, but we're still going to need the hard infrastructure. Even if we engage in telemedicine, ultimately, if you're really, really sick, Matthew, you're going to go to the hospital, yep. right? That's just the reality of what it is. There will be an ultimate fulfillment slash execution component of everything that you do online. Um, so I always encourage people if they're investing in traditional real estate to think about ways that that traditional real estate intersects with, has an intersection point with cloud at the end of the day, or any of the themes that are coming out of cloud, right? So, so we have a question from a student who I think you might be familiar with, um, Louise Andreef, I think is a friend of your daughter's perhaps, but she, she's asking a question as it relates to uh, you know, data privacy uh, and the implications of that maybe on your business model, both in the US and Europe and California in particular. So, I mean, any, any view of, of you know, the data privacy as it impacts your, um, your business model? Well, there's, there's not a material impact in the US. Um, you know, data sovereignty rules uh, don't exist between state to state. So you don't have to warehouse data specifically as it emanates from a domain. So if you're sending an email from Florida that's going ultimately to California, um, do you have to keep a, re a requisite copy uh, of that email in both, both domains? The answer is no. Uh, in Europe, you do, actually. Europe, Europe, most of the European nations have data, data sovereignty. So when a transaction or anything emanates from a country, they keep a copy of it. And then it ultimately transmits across border. And then that country has to keep a copy of it. So you know, a lot of what's fueling our growth in Europe is cloud adaptation and data sovereignty. Um, because the EU has very, very strict rules around um, data protection and data sovereignty rights in the US. You know, we, we tend to be a little more open, unfortunately, um, which is some of the debate we have at the board of the FCC right now. Yeah. Can you talk about parts of the world where um, you aren't at that you think are ripe for future investment? We're not in Africa right now. I mean, we've looked at a lot of things in Africa. Uh, it's a massive continent, massive population. Um, mobile infrastructure has been thriving there for about 15 years. So cell towers and cell tower companies have started up there in the last decade and are performing reasonably well, but it's, it's really a continent that really has no significant dark fiber and really doesn't have a lot of, you know, what I would call uh, compute and, and storage from a data center perspective. So there's a, there's a lot of opportunity in Africa for fiber and for data centers. We've looked at a lot of interesting things there. We just haven't pulled the trigger. But it is probably the last, you know, core hemisphere we're not we're not involved in today, at uh, at Colony. So we've heard a lot from the CEOs of very traditional office REITs saying we got to get people back into the buildings and we we've got to get back to reality. Which look, we all want to do that. Um, but on the other side, we're talking to the CEO of benefits, you know, directly, and his company and his shareholders benefit directly from this Zoom environment that we're living in right now. What's your view of how things uh, sort of shake out and sort of equalize, normalize, stabilize, whatever it might be um, post sort of vaccine? Well, look, I would say just using us as an example, you know, we're going to reduce our, our office footprint. And this was pre-COVID, we were reducing our office footprint. We were going to uh, reduce our office footprint by 50% globally. And now we're probably taking that up to 65, 70%. And we're, we're, you know, the new offices that we are opening, we've totally redesigned, uh, much more open architecture, no private offices, um, more, more about, you know, workspaces where people can show up for the day, plug in, you know, be productive and then parachute out. And so, you know, things like platooning, um, parachuting, uh, telecommuting, these are all things that are now going to be part of the norm because certain organizations like us, we've been, we've been incredibly productive in COVID. We haven't lost a step um, and most of our offices have been closed. So we're operating at 10% capacity in New York. Uh, and even when we offer it to people in New York, they don't wanna come in yet. It's quite interesting. Los Angeles is closed, Singapore just reopened. London is now in another you know, two week shutdown and uh, South Florida, we're at 50% capacity. So, but even when we come back and we return to normal, the way we're designing our office space, the way we're thinking about bringing people back to work is very different than what it was pre-COVID. And I think that's what a lot of CEOs are grappling with is, you know, how to make sure people come back and get that, get that human interaction where we're, we're in front of each other face to face. It's, it's a powerful um, 
you know, it's a powerful part of any, any culture of any organization is that ability to connect with people and to build culture. I don't think you can build culture through Zoom. I think you have to build culture face to face, but you know, what we see ourselves doing is in, instead of spending more money on office rent, we're going to be spending more time on strategic retreats where we go to certain cities where some of our portfolio companies are, and we do deep immersions for three or four days in those cities in that asset class, in that vertical, you know, where we're integrating with our operating companies and we're bringing our investment team together. So we see the way that we interact and the way that we're going to meet as being a little bit different than it was pre-COVID. Um, and that day-to-day, -day, you know, sort of grind of going into the office, I think that changes a little bit, at least for us. Got it. Perfect. Well, I've got one more question, and then we're going to invite Stuart back in here to ask his question. But clearly, we clearly we run at the Steer Center a very traditional real estate um, offering here at the undergraduate and graduate level. And gentlemen like Bob Steers and Sonny Kelsey are advocating strongly for real assets, and that's sort of the direction, as as evidenced by this conversation, where a lot of this industry is going. If you were running a real estate program, are you advising Wharton and Zell Lori? What are you telling them they should be offering? And what 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 do you think the real estate curriculum looks like in 10 years? And I'm taking notes, by the way, Mark. Yeah, well, I think, look, the asset class is shifting and the sands are shifting under our feet very quickly. I was talking to Peter Lindemann a couple of weeks ago about this. And, you know, we're, we're trying to put together a digital uh, track just for Zell Lori because right now they do zero research and it's, you know, it's not only just American Tower, Crown, and SBA, but it's Equinix and Digital Realty. 50% of the top 10 REITs are now digital REITs. So as, as we think about what's next generation learning for our bright young minds that are coming out, there, there has to be an adaptation or an integration of digital infrastructure, digital real assets, digital real estate into the curriculum, because that's going to be what's going to fuel the global economy going forward. And so I think when we pick our heads up, Matt, in 10 years from now, you're going to see a track related to um, digital real estate or, you know, how does digital infrastructure impact traditional real estate um, or how does prop tech, by example, uh, impact real estate. There's so many different ways that digital is impacting and influencing the future of real estate. And as I always tell everybody, I didn't go to Wharton to get a degree in climbing a cell tower. You know, nobody taught me that. And it's kind of what's what's strange about our industry is a lot of it is self-taught and it would be great if we could institutionalize some of that. So, so I lied. I'm going to ask one more question based on what you said. So, you know, a lot of our students love the physical real estate. Look, I love the physical real estate. The idea of buying something that's broken and, you know, fixing it and, 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 and you know, the physicality of it, the, the, the impact you can have on a community, society. And when you talk about things like infrastructure, it's kind of like, yeah, I'm not so sure about that, right? It, it, it maybe doesn't scratch the same itch. So if you're talking to a bunch of, uh, undergraduates and MBA students here that may not uh, be giving it the credit that it's due, like sell the sizzle on this thing, man. Like what, what would, you know, how should they be thinking about it differently? Well, look, it's, it's not, um, it's not as sexy as building a, going into an enterprise zone and, and building a mixed use facility that brings a lot of local economic benefit. It's a different kind of economic benefit. I think the things that we do, we're, we're doing just as much community building as traditional real estate does. I think if we think about the communities that we're connecting and that we're bringing broadband services to, particularly in, in low income areas and in areas that, that don't have the economic profile to get that digital investment, those are places we're going now. And we're making those investments. And you go into places like, particularly like Colombia and Chile and Peru, and you think about some of the things that we're doing in Southeast Asia, we're literally connecting communities for the first time. So there's a lot of community building that we do that makes us feel pretty proud. Um, there's some projects that we've done that are very high profile with particular governments around the globe where we've brought you know, stronger public safety, uh, which really helps us deal with, you know, um, candidly with terrorism threats on a lot earlier basis. Um, there's some work we've done with the US federal government that's been very interesting. So it's different kind of stuff that's fulfilling. Um, it's perhaps not as, um, immediately uh, gratifying as it would be, you know, uh, touching that great, you know, multifamily property or, or touching a great mixed use property. But for us, it, it has, it has intrinsic benefits. Um, and most of all, we feel pretty good about, you know, generally bringing the global economy forward because we know the work that we do enables the planet to keep going. So that's, that's pretty satisfying for us. 
I love it. Well, so again, I'm going to ask one more question because uh, you keep saying interesting stuff and then I'm going to bring Stuart in. So, you know, in the commercial real estate space, if, if you can raise five or $10 million of equity and you have a, have, you know, some operational background and, and you can, you can access a, a deal or a product, you, you, you can, you can make a go at it as a real estate investor on a very small scale. Yep. It, it, you know, is there a corollary for, for, you know, for your business, maybe excluding data centers and maybe I'm not even sure why I'm excluding them, but it just seems like there's a, that the scale element of this is really important. And if there's somebody on the, on the zoom that's saying, well, how, how could we start to build this into our business? Is it possible? And, and at, at a small scale? Well, we wrote our first business plan in 1994. We were just happy to build our first cell tower yeah. and get our first order from Bell Atlantic Mobile. And that was a victory unto itself. My original partners, Jeff and Alex. And, you know, you never forget that moment you sign your first lease and I'll never forget it. It was a, a site that we built in Cherry Hill, New Jersey uh, with Bell Atlantic Mobile. And what's interesting is um, I have a bunch of friends in the industry that build anywhere from two to six towers a year and they do it with their family and they maybe have two or three contractors that work for them. And the cell tower space is actually a mom and pop space. There's close to 500 different cell tower operators in the United States. And so that's a very localized business. So, you know, if, if you wanted to, you know, put up $50,000 of equity and go borrow the other 150,000 and go build a cell tower for Verizon, because you know that county better than anybody else. And you know how to get those entitlements, Matt, that works. You can go do, you know, two, three, four of those a year. And if your opening cash flow is $25,000 per year and you build four of those a year, that's $100,000 of cash flow. Now you've risked 200,000 of equity, right? Against that $100,000 yield. And then you've got operating expenses of 25,000. So you've netted 75K in NOI against an equity investment of 200K, provided you can get the right leverage. That feels very much like real estate, right? And I see you shaking your head because you're doing the returns really quick. You're like, I like well, that, that payback cash. period works pretty nice, actually. <laughs> so cell towers, you can do that. Um, fiber, you can do that on a regional basis. Data centers, too hard now. You're right. Yeah. Data yeah. centers has become a big boys game. If you're going to deal with Microsoft and Google, you have to be massively credentialed. You have to be trusted. Really hard to break in. Um, you know, and the small cell space also. It's it's a different space than towers. You're yeah you're being trusted to run somebody's network for them. So a lot of our business is, is involves trust and trust of the customers because they're relying on me every day to wake, you know, I, I wake up every day and every asset we own globally, Matt, has to perform at 99.9999% uptime. That's a big burden. Right. And, um, you know, that's why we've stayed in business so long is because we're, we're very good at operating our assets. Well, I love it, man. I could keep doing this because this is really interesting stuff, but I'm going to turn it over to Stuart Lerner to take us home, my friend. Please do it. Thank you. Well, I actually wanted to ask two quick questions. I'll keep them brief. Uh, but going off of that, you sold me on digital and I'm sure many others can say the same, but if you were starting a career in digital real estate today, where would you focus? I would probably focus on um, managed IT services and cybersecurity. So those are actually um, really asset light models, Stuart, where you don't have to spend, you know, $500 million in Ashburn building a, a massive data center. So businesses that are more like SaaS as infrastructure, to me, that's really interesting. It's something we're starting to spend some time around. So as the world becomes more virtualized and you think about, for example, you know, enterprise, you know, cor corporate cybersecurity, you know, corporations are really very open and blind right now about that. And so it's a, it's a data center like model, but you don't have to go and build a data center. And so if you can manage that critical IT load and you can manage that cybersecurity threat effectively, there's gonna be a lot of enterprises that need that service. So I, I kind of like this notion of SaaS as infrastructure um, in the data center sector. That's, a, that's an emerging trend over the next 10 years. And then I would say probably the easiest is cell towers. I mean, that's just the, the easiest brick and mortar um, anyone can get a permit, you know, can you build it? Can you find the right location? That's a bit more, you know, real estate intensive, but always a good place to start. Awesome. Thank you for that. And one last question. What do you know now that you wish you knew when you were graduating from college? Ooh. Um, boy, that's, there's so many lessons learned there. What I always tell people is, <clears throat> you know, 
the Georgetown's going to give you a great toolkit. Um, what you choose to do with your toolkit is up to you. So I, I've had this conversation with my daughter before because she's a perfectionist and wants to get straight A's all the time. And I tell her, look, I, I read a lot of resumes that have a 3.4 and a 3.6 and, and I hire them because I hire them based on their attitude and their desire to want to compete. Never forget that I'll take attitude, you know, over aptitude every day of the week. Um, the ability of a human being and the, the indelible spirit of a human being to want to compete and win, I value that highly. And so as you go through school, you know, the grades are certainly important, but being in the community of Georgetown is probably more important. And I didn't, I didn't fully appreciate and value all the friendships that I had uh, when I was at college. But now that I, I pick my head up and I look around and I see Jonathan Gray running Blackstone, I see Josh Harris running Apollo, and I see um, a bunch of my friends now uh, running big organizations, you know, really enjoy your friendships, Stuart. Uh, enjoy the camaraderie of group learning. It was the most fun for me. My last year at Wharton, I took all grad classes, which are very interactive. Uh, you spend very little time sitting in a classroom. You spend more time in group think. But really the opportunity to make great friendships and, and interact with a lot of smart people, these are people that you're going to intersect with again. And so building that relationship currency with your colleagues and your cohorts is invaluable. So uh, make sure you take advantage of that because that's something you're not going to get back in the future. And I wish I'd taken more advantage of it when I was at Wharton, but I didn't. Um, thankfully, some of my friends ended up going to take on big jobs at, at other organizations, but it's a lot of fun to watch my friends um, that, I, that I got educated with, you know, sort of grow up and evolve in the sector and take leadership positions. And you're gonna have that same experience with your cohorts at Georgetown. Stuart, I don't wanna to put too much pressure on you, man, but I'm, I'm sort of hoping you're gonna be the John Gray at Georgetown and I'm gonna need you big time in about 12, 15 years. Um, hey, Mark, thank you so much, man. I, this has been really uh, enjoyable. It was an opportunity for me to learn, frankly. So it was, it was a little bit biased and a little bit selfish, but um, I think we got you for at least another year here at Georgetown. So we'd love to pick your brain because uh, we certainly see the real assets opportunity with our, our leaders here at Georgetown uh, and our alumni. So have a great rest of your day. Everybody that joined, which was, I think we peaked out at about 111. That's awesome for something that went live on, on, on Monday. So, you know, clearly there's interest in the topic. So um, I, will, I, I will close this down here, but certainly appreciate everybody's involvement. So take care, everybody. Have a great weekend. Thanks, everyone.